And I'm, I'm going to uh, work on or present information on root maggot management, obviously, but all, and also springtails because we're kind of in a transition area. Uh, growers in the Grand Forks area, certainly uh, uh, some do have some pretty significant uh, springtail problems from time to time. So I'll cover that. And if there's time at the end, I can answer a few questions about grasshopper management. I can throw a couple of slides up as well if there's time again. So I'll start off with springtails. I've uh, showed a lot of this information before, but they're very tiny, uh, micro almost microorganisms. They're, uh, uh, they damage the plant in the early part of the growing season using chewing mouth parts. And uh, so it's mainly an early season problem. And uh, depending on the year, what the, uh, the uh, spring uh, weather is like, uh, they can cause some pretty substantial yield losses. They're kind of unusual in that they live their entire life cycle underground, at least these springtails do. There are other springtails that uh, live above ground. Uh, they produce multiple generations per year. So from one year to the next, or even within the growing season, we can't really put a nail on exactly where we're at in, uh, the, in their life cycle, because there's always a mix and a lot of overlap. Uh, they they do quite well in cool, wet springs, and it's not necessarily that they thrive in cool, wet springs, but their impact on the plant can be quite substantial during uh, those kind of conditions, under those kind of conditions, because uh, if it's cool and wet, the plants aren't going to develop very quickly. And so they are, that sort of sets the stage for the plants being very uh, vulnerable to attack by springtails. And we've seen trends where high organic matter soils and the heavier soils tend to support uh, springtails quite well. Um, this is a summary slide that I've showed you some groups before. Uh, just a, uh, it's a, from a combined analysis I did and I just wanted to show the kind of the dollars and cents of it. Uh, this is from a multi-year uh, trial that we did on a couple of rates of counter and then the three registered uh, seed treatment insecticides. And uh, you can kind of, the data sort of speaks, speak for themselves other than I wanna, uh, the asterisk there, I uh, wanna point out that it's from the American Crystal uh, uh, payment schedule during the years of that study. And then the other thing I wanna point out is this is gross revenue over the gain, or uh, a gain in revenue over the untreated check. So it's not a true uh, gross revenue in that we're not incorporating uh, treatment costs because those are quite variable from year to year. So uh, the two rates of counter shook uh, out at the, uh, at the top, but the uh, C treatments, as you can see, easily paid for themselves. So this is a bit of a gear shift, um, I guess. Uh, uh, so we've done a lot of trials in the Red River Valley uh, but in recent years, the growers in the, on the Montana, North Dakota border have had issues with uh, springtail control. And we've uh, determined actually uh, done some, a uh, lot of lab work to, to determine that they have a different species complex of springtails out there. Uh, but I think this actually uh, rolls nicely into what we're trying to do here. Um, this is data that uh, my project uh, uh, gathered uh, from some trials out there um, the last couple of years. Actually, I'll just show you the, the 2020 data. Um, but uh, it sort of set, it provides kind of a worst case scenario for um, uh, springtail management, I believe anyway, because they've got some pretty tough critters out there. Uh, so this first slide, there's a lot of treatments there, but they sort of go in order. So from left to right, we've got uh, three rates of counter from the highest to the, the lowest recommended rate. Um, and then next we've got a poncho beta treated seed with MIDAC T-banded. And then we have MIDAC T-banded alone. And then we have uh, MIDAC as a dribble in furrow. DIF indicates dribble in furrow with the microtubes. Uh, we have the same with, with Mustang. Again, that's on poncho beta treated seed two application uh, uh, placement methods. And then we've got Mustang alone, again, T-banded or dribble and furrow, but not on treated seed. 
Then we have Pancho Beta alone, cruiser, and then our untreated control. This is recoverable sucrose per acre. We had very good yields there, and we got a pretty good response from counter, as well as the Pancho Beta treated seed when we used MIDAC as well. But, and these letters, just to kind of give, give you sort of a refresher on the statistics here, anytime any bar, any treatment within here has at least any two treatments share at least one letter. They only have to have one letter in common to be not statistically different from each other. So everything in the yellow ovals or circles, uh, all of those are not statistically different from each other. So those were our better performing treatments. And then we took this to, uh, we used, uh, uh, actually used their payment schedule then as well. And this is gross revenue, not including application costs, but we also didn't separate out the untreated check. So these are raw, just revenue out of these treatments and, and they followed very similar patterns. So the quality wasn't really, there wasn't anything sticking out that any of these treatments was causing a negative impact on quality. So just kind of take homes on springtail management. I think most growers, as, as the survey indicated, were fairly happy with their springtail management, but a few did mention that they uh, maybe are not entirely uh, satisfied. Um, what we've, you can see it's a very uh, serious economic pest. Um, I guess I recommend, I wouldn't go lower than six pounds of product per acre if you're using counter. Uh, if you're using Mustang or MIDAC, uh, that will likely perform similar, but we have gotten reports of less than consistent res results from Mustang Max. We've gotten our best performance out of Mustang Max when we've applied it with pressurized nozzles as a T-band into the furrow. But I know growers are not too excited about having uh, maintaining nozzles on their larger planters. Uh, if you do experience uh, what you less than desired control, a two-pronged approach might be needed. So maybe a C treatment with either MIDAC or Mustang Max might be a way to go. And we've tested both of those products and they're safe to use with 10340 uh, starter fertilizer. So as uh, Dr. Peters had uh, done, I've got a similar uh, format. Uh, this is chapter two. This will be a little bit bigger chapter. We've got a lot of data to go through, uh, but I think it'll uh, uh, raise some eyebrows and uh, maybe offer some solutions for the root maggot problem that we have. These shots were taken at St. Thomas as the, uh, the uh, title indicates here. I uh, had kind of a unique opportunity um, in our plot area, this was a large area uh, that was uh, unfortunately had not gotten treatment yet. So it's, it's all untreated. And this shows the, the economic severity that the root maggot is uh, capable of, of uh, producing. And uh, on the far right here, you can see these are mummified uh, dead uh, sugar beet seedlings that uh, just plain didn't make it. So that's, that's what that looks like. It does, it can, that symptomology can in, indicate other things, but this is pretty classic root maggot um, uh, injury as well. So what's happening with the root maggot and what can we expect? Well, in 2020, or excuse me, 2021, we had a fairly normal single but very significant peak in fly activity around the 9th of June, give or take, depending on your latitude. But we had very hefty numbers at that time. This is, uh, this is valley wide. And then this, this is uh, probably one of those eyebrow razors. This is, uh, you've seen this data, data set before we add data to it each year. We, this is the results of a collaborative effort between uh, American Crystal and MINDAC as well as NDSU. And, uh, and what we do is we have a, this, this part of that work anyway, generates a Red River Valley average on a per 
flies per trap uh, basis uh, per year. And um, unfortunately in 2021, we surpassed all of the previous 14 years. So this is the highest fly counts on a valley average, valley wide average um, in the last 15 years. So we've got work to do, including me. Um, next, uh, there's, this is a little bit of good news. Uh, we've also been tracking for a number of years, root injury ratings. We, we go in and we do follow-up surveys in a lot of those, those uh, fly count fields. These are all from fly count fields that uh, we were monitoring throughout the growing season. And uh, thankfully, uh, this, this suggests that uh, growers that were, had that high fly activity did a good job of protecting roots because uh, there was actually a, over a 20% decrease in root injury incidents in those fields. Um, this next slide, I'll animate. It looks like a typo. Uh, we start with 2018. I'll animate it through every other year to uh, what we're expecting in 2022. So this is what we kind of uh, were facing in 2018. There's what we, it grew in 2020 for 2020. And this is what we're expecting for 2022. So despite that reduction in root injury ratings, there are still a number of fields within there that are high risk. And so the, the extent of, of uh, root maggot fly activity that we anticipate this year, and, and I like to view this as a risk map. This is not necessarily a population prediction, but it's really about risk and it's to help you manage risk. Um, this will be provided on uh, various websites as well, but this is, these are the specific locales that we expect high risk. Uh, North Dakota on the left, Minnesota on the right, and then moderate risk. And this will be, this is in the pocket guide as well. So uh, this information will be made very, uh, very available or readily available for you. Uh, similarly here, North Dakota on the left, Minnesota on the right. Um, I hope we uh, don't have too many additional towns in the future to add to these lists because I'm running out of room. So with that, um, I've been working for a long time trying to find you options to manage this very difficult pest. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the details of these materials and methods, but I did want to point out the highlighted portion here. Um, a lot of the data that you'll see is not just a single one-time run of an experiment. It's a combined analysis, and so it'll be multiple years. And in each case, I spent a lot of time um, going through the data and making sure that I could validly combine those data sets. And to combine them, sort of legally, pseudo-legally, uh, with regard to statistics, you need to have no significant treatment by year interactions, meaning the treatments should behave similarly across years or else you can't combine years. There, there's something wrong in there. Some, so um, anyway, this, these are pretty solid data sets that you'll see. So the first one is the results of a five-year combined analysis from N. Uh, pay attention to, we stopped at 2019 because these were treatments that were common to all those years. I can't combine data sets of, uh, with uh, years that have, uh, don't have this share the same treatments. So the data includes, um, I guess I should go through the treatments first. We just have one of the maximum rate of counter at planting time. Uh, and I probably should have a red line drawn through these Yuma. These are chloropyrifos formulations that are, uh, and as you all know, we'll not be able to use this coming year, but I wanted to include them anyway, so you can see where uh, something like Mustang might shake out. So what this initial um, first table is showing us uh, with regard to recoverable sucrose per acre, uh, and the blue box indicates that, uh, as you can see here, all of these treatments are sharing an A, as are all of these, sorry, <laughs> except for tonnage, I'm sorry, right here. 
So that's the only difference. But uh, with regard to recoverable sucrose per acre, none of these are significantly different from each other. Um, the uh, revenue was quite good. Again, this is similar to that first slide you saw where it's revenue gain over the untreated check. So compared to doing nothing, so it kind of teases out so you don't have to do the math in your head. So the best return was out of those couple of uh, Yuma treatments uh, uh, at the maximum rate of Yuma. Uh, but in with regard to revenue, this is not a statistical comparison, but dollars are dollars. And uh, because of quality issues and uh, pounds of sugar per ton, this one ended up providing slightly higher, again, not statistically outperforming, but uh, pretty decent revenue. So that was good news. Then that brings us to the next one where we, this is just the last couple of years where we had very high root maggot pressure at our uh, St. Thomas location. Similar treatments other than because fly populations were so high, this one includes the full rate of counter at planting for all of the insecticide treatments. And then we've got some dual applications of, of chlorpyrifos, and then we have a single at the high rate. And uh, what we found as far as uh, uh, treatments that were statistically not different from each other were the, the top two, the Yuma treatments where we were doing repeated applications and we got very good revenue um, per acre above, above the untreated check. Uh, Mustang didn't shake out quite so well in this scenario. Again, 2020 and 2021, where we had very severe root maggot pressure and you'll get to see some pictures of that uh, shortly. Uh, this is some shots of, uh, of what those plots looked like in 2021. Here's our untreated check. Pretty good indicator of the uh, capability of the root maggot to literally kill, kill plants. On the far left here in the middle, we've got counter at the high application rate, but as a standalone, which we wouldn't even recommend uh, that being a standalone in this growing, this part of the growing area. Uh, we do have a little bit of uh, missing plants here, and I'm not sure what happened there, but it just abruptly stops there. Doesn't necessarily to me say to me that it's root maggot, but there, there is some pressure there. You can see the canopy is not closed very well. We move over to the right. We've got that same uh, at plant plus Mustang, and we've got probably similar uh, canopy closure, maybe a little better, maybe a little better uh, consistent stand. But when we applied that Mustang uh, uh, twice, uh, maybe we got a slight response here, but as the data indicated, it wasn't statistically significant. Next, we were looking at uh, granular materials. And I, the reason I call it additive is but because we have both a at plant application of counter and a post-emergence band, uh, similarly, similar to how we, uh, some of the growers use thiamet. Um, so at the top, we've got the maximum rate of counter followed by the maximum rate of, of thiamet. Uh, the reason we don't apply counter again is because that would be off label. You can only apply counter once per growing season. Uh, but we got very good responses out of uh, the combining uh, a seed treatment at planting with a granule at planting or the seed treatment with a granule at post-emergence. And it performed very well. As you can see here, this is very nice and clean where the recoverable sucrose and the tons per acre were not statistically different from uh, for any of these top three treatments. And we got excellent revenues. Again, that's just above the untreated check. And this is what some of those plots look like. Again, this is 2021, untreated check, good pressure, counter plus thymet. Uh, that typically does pretty well. Uh, poncho beta alone, uh, straining a little bit. Again, we don't recommend poncho beta to be a standalone. If you've got moderate to high risk, you really should be planning on some form of additive protection. As you can see here, 
adding counter at planting with that poncho beta worked quite well, as did the poncho beta, uh, where we combined it with a post-emergence application of counter at that same rate. And you can see along the side here, these are four row plots and the alternating two rows are untreated buffers. You can see it looked like somebody went through there with a weed whacker. There's not hardly anything left. Um, next, uh, this next one, we're looking at other post-emergence options because chlorpyrifos is no longer a post-emergence option for, for us to manage maggots. As far as we know, it'll, it's gone for good. Uh, hopefully it does come back, but I, I don't have a lot of faith in that. Um, and so this, this trial is a five-year analysis. These are treatments that were common to the, that, this trial over the years. Um, Mustang Max after Poncho Beta treated seed or Movento HL. And uh, you can see here that the Mustang Max uh, centered program did uh, not only statistically outperform the, the Movento, but it was also not outperformed by the old standard. Uh, and that is just a, just to remind you, that is a single application of chlorpyrifos. This is what some of those plots look like. Again, very good uh, pressure. Poncho beta looked similar to those, uh, those uh, the previous study. Uh, as we move over to the right, we've got a at plant of just the moderate rate of counter at 7.5 pounds. That's straining. These two treatments, poncho beta and the moderate rate of counter, tend to perform at about uh, very similar levels. Here's poncho beta followed by Movento, which was applied around uh, six days ahead of peak fly on average. Then we have poncho beta, and I, I didn't include, I wanted to show you this picture from 2021. We, we looked at both one pint and two pints in, in 2021, and you can see a nice rate response here by going with the high, higher application of that product. Um, now you may say, why are you even including the Yuma in there? Uh, because we have a fairly good body of data that indicates that things like Mustang Max and uh, to a lesser extent, we have some data on Asana as well, suggesting that it probably works at a level comparable to one pint per acre. So you can see if we were to repeat that application, it, it, it's a kind of a wide extrapolation and maybe more statistical goal license than I should be taking, but I would suggest this points in a severe year or a severely infested location that a second or maybe even a third application of something like Mustang or Movento uh, may be warranted. And that brings us to our next data slide. This is the results of a six year combined analysis. Uh, we're looking at here at the first column, we've got the at plant regime, whatever that was, uh, poncho beta or counter at planting. And then using, uh, if we, you know, combining counter with poncho beta and do so making it either a dual application at plant or there are some dual applications where we have at plant plus post-emergence. Then we have as uh, to uh, steal the term from Dr. Peters, uh, kind of a nuclear nuclear treatments. Uh, and I, I guess I wouldn't call these quite nuclear because we just went with one pint of Lorisban 4E in this particular trial. Um, but I, I think that's actually good information because it, it may at least give us a hint to how some of those more moderately performing liquid insecticides like Asana, Midac, and Mustang, or excuse me, Mod Asana and Mustang might work uh, post-emergence. But by, by tripling, especially with a good solid at plant regime, uh, these treatments worked really well. And then adding a post-spray uh, easily paid for itself as well. And you heard me mention MIDAC a little bit. Uh, that's a product we've been working on for a few years. 
Um, and, but we've uh, been kind of playing around with placement between T-band and modified, or excuse me, dribble inferral. And uh, so we're uh, settling more on the dribble inferral because we know that's what growers prefer. And uh, as this table indicates, so I guess I should explain some of the treatments here. We've got okay. counter at the high rate by itself. Uh, and then Pancho Beta is in here a few times, a couple times, uh, either as a standalone with fertilizer or with MIDAC at planting. And that treatment in particular did quite well relative to the high application rate of counter as a standalone. Again, these are not recommended treatments in this area, but we kind of need to look at them uh, individually and, and sort of take baby steps into this to make sure we're, we're getting activity out of these materials. Uh, one other thing to point out in this slide is, if you'll notice this treatment, the third from the bottom counter at the moderate rate, plus, and then this is not plus. So we applied it in a band as a band, and then we followed on the planter at the same time uh, actually, the 1034-0 was going down dribble and furrow first. The furrow was partially closing, and then we banded the counter over the top. But we did see it wasn't statistically significant all the time, or over the years we haven't seen it. But in this case, it was that we had a significant drop in yield when we added that 1034-0. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. I think that's because we had a dry year this past year that really pushed that down. Uh, that uh, 1034 o can be kind of hot in a dry, a warm, dry year. And uh, that's illustrated also when you compare the two checks, the plain untreated check and then the fertilizer check. Uh, we had a slight depression in yield also, and the gross revenue above the untreated check was actually below the untreated uh, check. And this is what some of those uh, uh, plots looked like. Our untreated check here. Here's Poncho Beta alone, MIDAC alone. And then we go to the bottom row, far left, Poncho Beta with MIDAC. Now that doesn't look stellar, but you have to remember again that we probably wouldn't recommend this as a standalone treatment that you'd, a grower in a high risk area would still need to come back with some form of post-emergence uh, program. Our counter, at plant by itself at that moderate rate actually looked pretty decent here. Again, with very good pressure along the outsides of these plots. And then when they added that fertilizer, we had a little issue with stand establishment. Okay, just a couple more slides, uh, getting close here. Uh, I wanted to show you a little bit of this. Some of these are experimental materials, so I don't want you to take too much of this uh, as a uh, gospel yet. This is just a two-year trial where we were looking at, and these are, these are single applications. That's one really important thing to keep in mind here, uh, which again, we don't recommend. This is the high rate of counter, moderate rate of counter. Then we've got a sauna XL with exponent, which is a synergist that can enhance the toxicity of pyrethroid insecticides like Asana and like Mustang. And we did see that here. I can't declare it as being statistically significant, but uh, the interesting thing here, and this, this is a T-band at plant of Asana, either with or without that synergist, um, that it did push the Asana performance up to where it was not outperformed by the max rate of counterfeit 20 G. Uh, this is what some of those plots looked like. Again, I'm just remind you, these are single applications that we don't recommend, but we need to look at anyway. And here's where that Asana is by itself. And then with the synergist. So without any at plant protection, we are seeing stand protection. It's very obvious there. Uh, we're getting some activity out of dibrome, but I, 
it's got a very short residual. So it might fit into a program where you're having to spray two to three times on the same field. That could be one of your, your applications. So to summarize root maggot control, uh, we've got a pretty serious situation on our hands. So we, we need to maybe change our thinking and look more at maybe consider the concept of population management more than just protecting roots because you saw from the fly activity to the root injury surveys that we did that roots are being protected, but populations are still at the, uh, at least in 2021 at almost explosive levels. So 2022 is lining up to probably be a challenge, not only because of those populations, but also because we won't have that uh, very efficacious tool called Pyrifos. So uh, we have the data that I showed you suggests that things like Asana and Mustang and uh, Midac can be helps. And especially if we integrate those uh, materials with other, other um, tools. So those of you, that are in the root maggot range. So from moderate to high, especially, uh, but know your risk in your area. So pay attention to that uh, forecast. I would urge you to keep an eye on your, your individual fields and to pay close attention to what's happening on the, on the website with the uh, posted fly counts. And if you're in a high pressure area, you're probably gonna to have to start looking at integrating either your app plant or post-emergence tools uh, for kind of a combined approach. Uh, just going through the insecticides, Asana XL, we've mainly looked at it as an app plant, but we have some old data uh, as a sh showing that it's somewhere in the ballpark of a Mustang post-emergence. Uh, counter 20G, thankfully continues to be an effective tool and it can be used at plant or post-emergence, just can't be used both in the same field. MIDAC, uh, dribble in furl, tends to perform similar to that moderate rate of counter, but it's not a standalone tool. Mustang Max and Movento, I think we still need to do more work on them. Uh, they're probably not going to be as effective as uh, chlorpyrifos, so in high risk areas, heavy areas, heavy pressure areas, at least two and potentially a third application of something in there, uh, pre-peak, right on peak, and maybe even a post-peak fly uh, to, again, to manage populations. Thymet 20G, I didn't show you a, a huge amount of data on that, but we've got a large data set that shows that timing is very flexible if you have the equipment to apply it post-emergence it can be very effective between five and even 15 days ahead of peak fly. So it's very flexible that way. Um, with that, and I'm just about out of time here, I think, um, I wanna thank the r &E board for funding much of the work uh, that we do. And uh, uh, I also wanna thank the cooperators that have allowed us to do research on their land, uh, Daryl Collette, uh, Wayne and Austin Lassard as well. I want to thank American Crystal Ag staff for uh, uh, this last year. They really uh, beat the bushes and uh, increased our coverage a lot on the fly counts. Uh, CNR Ventures out of St. Thomas for allowing us to get water from them often for our spray tanks. Uh, Germain Seed Technology for treating our seed. Uh, many in the seed and crop protection industry for allowing us to use their use and test their products. I want to thank my summer crew, uh, especially Jake Rickus, my technician, who makes sure uh, a lot of the stuff of the project is done right and done well. And, uh, and then I want to thank uh, USDA, NIFA, and acknowledge them for partial uh, funding support of my project as well. With that, I thank you.